In this section, I will teach you about how you can adapt your regular object-oriented thinking into the way you have to think about things in Julia. And I'm going to do that by going through some well-known examples from object-oriented design patterns. I'm going to use examples uh, that I got inspired from in the classic book called Design Patterns by the Gang of Four. So we're going to look at how we can mimic interfaces, inheritance, and polymorphism, and other common central concepts in object-oriented programming, and how you can adapt that to Julia. The first video in this section is on Julia interfaces. So I'm going to be starting with giving you a motivation behind using the interpreter design pattern, which is what I'm going to demonstrate here. Then go through the, the main idea, how it works. And then I'm going to contrast a solution uh, in Julia with Java. So you can see more easily how is it different? How do you think different when working with Julia? So let's think a bit about the motivation for uh, the interpreter patterns. If you can consider an expression like this, a plus three larger than four minus two times b. Now uh, this could exist in a lot of languages and this would get parsed. And we're not going to care about how you parse this. It's outside of the scope, but we're interested in how would you represent uh, this expression after you parsed it. And what's common is to use so-called expression trees, which this is an example of. And they're very handy for evaluating this whole expression because it allows you to use a recursive structure where you start at the root node and you ask the root node, which is the larger than symbol, evaluate yourself. And it evaluates itself by asking its left and right operands to, or nodes to evaluate themselves. And of course, they can't do that right away without asking their children to evaluate themselves. And once uh, you've gotten down to the leaves, you can start moving upwards uh, with your evaluated values upwards in the tree. So I've color coded this here so that the yellow nodes are the variable expressions. The red ones are the number literal expressions and the green ones are the binary operators or binary expressions. In this video, I'm going to use um, a simpler example. So it's just going to use this alpha plus beta minus 10 expression, which we can represent with this tree. So if we wanted to evaluate this whole expression, then uh, the root node would ask the um, addition node here to evaluate itself. And we would evaluate the alpha and beta node. And then once they're evaluated, you can evaluate the plus by adding these two results together and then then you can start evaluating the node higher up and repeat this so the question is how do we represent a structure like that within the type system so we can have different concrete classes like add expression variable expression and number expression and subtract expression to represent the individual types of expressions but because a particular expression can't know what kind of child expressions they have they have to have a kind of shared interface it, and that's the purpose of the expression interface here all the classes have to implement that and it's it's pretty simple it just has a single method called evaluate which takes a context object so client is the class that creates our expression tree and our context objects, uh, which are basically binding values to variables and provide that to uh, the tree. 
when evaluating it. So first we're going to look at interfaces. And let's start with something familiar like Java. It's probably going to look similar if you're using C Sharp, C++, or even Google's Go. So here I'm defining this interface in Java just as a single method evaluate which takes the context object and returns a number and we can have an example of how to implement that for a num number literal the number literal will just simply store the, the literal number and then when you're evaluating you're just simply returning that value so let's look at how we would do these kind of interfaces in julia the important thing to remember is that they are implicit always implicit in Julia. So the first thing you got to do is define an abstract type expression. So you're not defining an interface per se. And then we create a method of the evaluate function where we take this abstract type as an argument and produce an error message. So this is to make sure that that if we should be using evaluate at runtime and we have not created a evaluate method which takes a concrete expression object then we get an error message and so people are reminded they need to implement this of course the system doesn't depend on this function existing uh, this is mainly a way of catching errors in your implementation. So let's do um, the uh, Java example of having a concrete subtype of the number expression. So here we're creating a number expression type, which is a subtype of expression, and it has a single field of type number. And evaluate is the same. We're just simply returning this value. A more complex case is defining a binary operator such as add or subtract. And then we're dealing with two operands. So in the first line we have A is the left operand and B is the right operand. But it can be more complex. So in the second line, the left operand of plus is x minus 3. And of course this all goes recursive because x is the left operand of minus and so on so that's the the add expression and subtract expression uh, subtypes the way we would implement add expression is making it as a subtype expression and then you can see that the left operand and the right operand are both of type expression so that we can put any expression type as the left and right operand all we need to know is that we can run the evaluate function with them. So then we have to define evaluate for the add expression. And that simply works by evaluating the left and the right operand and then adding them together and returning the results. So if left operand is also a, a some other binary operator, it will perform the same function and return the result. So this will just keep on going recursively until we get our result. So far we haven't looked at the context object because it hasn't really been needed. We haven't done anything with it when it gets passed into the evaluate function. But when we're dealing with variable expressions, uh, it's useful. So the context maps a variable name to a value. So in our example here, we're simply wrapping a dictionary, mapping a string to a number to achieve that. And we're having just a simple function named lookup to get this value. That allows us to define the variable expression. Uh, just It just has a variable name, and then we're using that variable name when we're evaluating and use that to make a lookup in the context object. So this allows us to put all the pieces together and show you how you can create an, a tree of uh, expression 
objects. So let's go back to the tree I showed you earlier. We can create the leaf nodes first. So we're creating the uh, variable expression alpha and beta, and then the number literal 10. Once we create those, we can create inner nodes like the add expression, and the add expression can be used to create the root node. And then we have our final expression object, which we can evaluate with a context. So in this case, we bound two to the alpha variable and four to beta. So if we evaluated this expression, we would get minus four. Of course, in practice, I'm not going to create individual object for something like this. I'll probably write just a simple or a single statement creating all the variables or all the tree objects in one go. And then I'll evaluate that expression with the context. So let's do a recap. The important thing for you to remember is that while your traditional object-oriented languages like Java has explicit interfaces with Julia, they are always implicit. And one way you can define them implicitly is by pretending your abstract types are uh, like an interface, and then we create some error-producing uh, methods to help us avoid uh, creating runtime errors. And then finally, I showed you how we can represent a whole expression by a tree of nodes.